All right, so it is 11 o'clock. We have more folks joining. Um, welcome, but we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks again for being here. I'd like to share some reminders before we kick off our session today. First off, you might have noticed that we are recording this session because we'd like to make it available on our website after the conclusion of the symposium. Um, we've also uh, are hosting this session in the Zoom webinar format, which provides some additional security and stability with so many folks on the call. That does impede a bit of the conversation that we could have with you all, so we apologize for that, but we do have the Q&A feature enabled through this platform, so we encourage you all to send your questions using the Q&A, and we'll get to as many questions as we can in sort of the last third of this session, at least the last 15 minutes. Um, we also have captioning available during this session, and you can enable that by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And then finally, our moderator today is Chrisanna Hughes. Chrisanna is Dr. Colleen Cipriani's executive assistant, and we just want to say thank you, Chrisanna, for keeping our tech moving smoothly in the background. And if you have any issues, please feel free to reach out to Chrisanna Hughes. So with that, I will get into our program. So today's talk will include remarks by Vice President Janelle Beavers, followed by Vice President Colleen Cipriani's opening introduction. I'll be sharing questions with Dr. Cipriani to move through the first half of our time together, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, please use that Q&A feature if you missed that. And if you're just joining now, um, we encourage questions to come through there. I'm sure we're not gonna be able to get to all of the questions, but we'll try our very best. So as we begin, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which our university stands by reading our land acknowledgement. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is founded as a land grant institution and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion. And significantly, that our founding came at the dire cost to native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. Thank you for listening and absorbing these words with intention this morning. So now it's my pleasure to introduce CSU's Vice President for Strategy, Janelle Beavers. Vice President Beavers, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Britt. Um, I'm excited to join all of you on behalf of President McConnell and Provost Pedersen, who were unable to join us for this session. While they are not with us, I bring with me their support and excitement in officially welcoming Dr. Colleen Cipriani to our university um, community. Dr. Cipriani joined us in August at a very exciting time um, in Colorado State's university's history through the efforts of our courageous strategic transformation and alignment with the framework of inclusive excellence, CSU is at the beginning of a new chapter for diversity, equity, and inclusion work. This envisioned future will build upon the efforts of previous leaders, employees, and students, and is only possible because of their work and, de and dedication. CST is at a pivotal moment. The drafting groups are in the midst of several rounds of open fora with the CSU community and are now working to implement the feedback um, into their recommendations. These groups, along with the president and provost and leadership teams, will be looking to finalize the draft of our strategic plan by the end of December. Inclusive excellence is not only um, a focus area of these efforts, but it's really woven throughout each piece of the plan and serves as a foundation um, on which our future efforts will be built. So we're really excited about that. The connection between inclusive excellence and our CST serves as an appropriate segue to introduce CSU's second vice president in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and our first vice president for inclusive excellence, Dr. Colleen Cipriani. I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know Colleen. I think she is a huge asset to our community, um, and I'm really honored to get to introduce her today. I'm really excited for our attendees um, who will get to learn more um, about you today, um, and welcome, Colleen. 
Thank you, Janelle. Um, thank you for that warm welcome. Thank you for Britt for, for, for hosting this, this conversation. And thank you to MJ, our interpreter, and for Kirsana for providing the tech backup. So I think I'm just going to start with some general information about myself, right? And then we can get straight to Q&A. So for those of you who don't know, um, I was actually born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago, um, which is in the Caribbean, right off the coast of Venezuela, lovely tw twin island state, um, and came here on a student visa. Uh, to go to college. I'm a proud graduate of an HBCU, a historically Black college and university, Prairie View a and University in Prairie View, Texas. So I spent my first four years in this country he, there, getting my undergraduate degree and then on to Purdue for graduate degrees and many jobs. Um, after that, I went to UNC where I served as an associate dean for inclusive excellence in the School of Public Health there, the Gillian School of Global Public Health. And now here I'm at, I am at CSU. Another interesting fact that many people find interesting about me is that I have a, I started in a STEM field. I am a trained microbiologist. That's what my degrees are in. Um, I did not plan to be, uh, to, to be a diversity professional, but as I have often said, you know, people don't really grow up and say, yeah, this is what I want to be a diversity professional. I'm going to be the vice president of inclusive excellence. Um, uh, but like many professionals who, who many of my colleagues in this work, I came to this work you know, sort of on a winding path that started with a job in women in science programs at Purdue University, which I took while I was finishing my PhD. And um, I took it as a means to an end. I had run out of funding. I needed, I needed, I needed money uh, to finish my PhD. And I, even as I was doing it, I thought, you know, my plan would still be to go on and be uh, a, a researcher because that's what I went into microbiology to do and to be researcher in microbiology. But that experience working in the women in, um, women in science programs at Purdue was my introduction to diversity and inclusion, equity, social justice work in higher education. It was over 20 years ago. And clearly I was hooked after that because the opportunities that came my way and the choices that I made um, in terms of my career after that, despite having a microbiology background have all been around how to broaden access to higher education for people who have similar backgrounds to me. I'm a first generation um, college student in, in, in my family. Um, I, I came as an international student and I've been in this country for 30 years and my lived experience is that as, you know, in the physical body that I have, a black woman in the US. Um, so all of those things I um, experience and live out, whether I was doing microbiology or whether I was doing social justice work. So I chose to make a career out of this work, primarily so that people who had identities that are similar to mine or have other marginalized identities that I, that I don't share, but I understand the struggle, um, would have better experiences when they come to campus. We need to broaden access for individuals and we also, mean, we also need to ensure that they have positive experiences when they spend a portion of their life here, whether it's four years getting one degree or longer, or whether they choose to launch a career with us here at Colorado State. So I think that's it for my introduction, <laughs> Britt, and you know, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Cipriani, Colleen, uh, for that great introduction. And yeah, we'll get the conversation rolling with our first question. So we, for the folks who have just joined us, we have a list of questions that we sourced um, from various folks in our network. Um, so we're gonna start with those questions and then towards the last um, third or so of the session, we'll open it up for your questions. So please use that Q&A feature. So Colleen, your first day at CSU was August 2nd, mm -hmm. and I can only imagine how busy it's been since then. <laughs> Could you give us a general overview of your first few months so far? Yeah, so um, my first few months have been, you know, really consumed with getting to know the 
culture here, getting to know, of course, my new colleagues, you, everyone else in the Office of Inclusive Excellence. Um, when I was going through the interview process, there were nine people in this office. And as of August 2nd, there were 50 plus people, right? So, so uh, staff and individuals from the um, resource and cultural centers merged with what was the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to become this new Office of Inclusive Excellence. So um, uh, being a part of that process, which as many of you probably already know, it's much more difficult than just moving a reporting line on a piece of paper. Um, but working uh, get through to get that done seamlessly and quickly and also you know meeting individuals and meeting the people that I will be working with getting to know individuals getting to know systems and processes here and getting to know the culture I think is what you know has taken most of my time you know as with any new employee, right? Um, moving to Fort Collins and to Colorado was a big deal for me. I've never lived out West. I've, I've been out here for various meetings over the course of my career, but never lived out here. So um, thank you to all the people who warned me about the effect of the dry weather on my skin and gifted me with lots of lotion. I think I'm good till Christmas, till uh, December. So yeah, so so that's been, that's taken up the first three months. <laughs> this sounds just a little exciting. There's just a little bit going on. Yeah. <laughs> well, so we, like you mentioned, you know, we know that this work can be challenging, but it also is full of joys as well. Yeah. What's been your favorite part about this role so far? You know, I, I have met a lot of joyful people um, since, since I've come and I've appreciated that. One of the ways in which I, as an individual approach, approach this work, but really it's how I approach life is um, I, I'm, I try to be positive and, um, and I, approach, I approach life with, with joy. So I enjoy working with other people who can find joy in little things during the day, especially when we might be working on a particularly tough project or something, we're dealing with something negative or nasty that has happened that day or that week. Um, I, 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 think, I think there's a way to move through this world and to do this work that is centered enjoy and I've met a lot of people and there are people on my team who are like that too and that not to be redundant but has filled me with joy <laughs> so. absolutely and it sounds like you're obviously a very people oriented person which is something I've really enjoyed about working with you so far and so yeah getting joy from others is absolutely a way to fill fill your cup so keeping on the theme of joy, what fuels or inspires you personally in this work? Um, you know, I went into this work. I think, I, I, I think the reason why I joined and the reason why I'm still here, it's the same reason, right? And I said it at the beginning. So again, apologies for repeating myself, but it's, it's really to me, it, is, it has always been about the student experience. I'd like to think that people choose to stay on a college campus because they want to work with and alongside and for students, right? You know, uh, and I have always found it so exciting. I remember when I spend most of my, day, my time during the day in a classroom, I have always found it exciting to be a part of the learning process of a student, to be there when something clicked. So I also spent a lot of time as a graduate student TAing. And so, so, so you know, those are, those are, that is the reason why I have chosen to build my career in higher education on a campus. I love the fact that, you know, we're helping mostly younger people, but you know, they're also non-traditional students find their way to a career. I'm excited that I have found my way to a career that I loved, even though it was not a linear path, many people's are not. And I wanna be a part of that for students, right? So um, did I answer the question? I feel like I rambled a little bit. No, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll switch gears too, since we've expanded on joy. We might come back to joy. There's okay. always time for joy, but we'll, we'll go into some other topics. So sure. 
Um, you've spoken a bit in, in meetings and places you've been around campus about the need to in, um, infuse inclusive excellence into everything we do and be taken yes. on by every person. Can you expand on this philosophy? Yes, absolutely, Britt. Okay, um, pause on the joy. We're getting into serious stuff now. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I have been in spaces prior to CSU where inclusive excellence, so whether we want to call it DEIJ work for diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice work, um, has been relegated to a sideline and sometimes tacked on at the end of things like an afterthought. So um, I have always try to remind my colleagues and help my, my colleagues get to this place where all of us can and should, if you ask me, in my opinion, should be doing our work with an equity lens, right? So specifically when I think about leaders and the, the decision, all the decisions that have to be made um, on a campus this size for our campus community, students, employees, you know, um, whether they're on campus or out in the state, you know, there are lots of decisions that we're making every day for our commu campus community. Are we making those decisions with an equity lens? Uh, and even more specifically, because this is something that I've often had to remind uh, colleagues about, is when we make decisions, are we thinking about the individuals who are likely to have the most negative impact? Because generally, those aren't the people sitting around the table, at the decision-making table. So, so that's sort of where I'm coming from when I say we don't want inclusive excellence to be relegated to, oh, if there's an issue or if there's a certain group of individuals um, that we're talking about, we want it to be a part of how we view our work, no matter what that work is. Um, I, I would argue, and I'd love to have conversations, I should, probably shouldn't be using the word argue, robust conversation with, <laughs> with, 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 with people who don't see how their work fits in to, to IE. Um, I've had this conversation many times over the years with everyone from professors, and I'm thinking specifically about this one physics professor a long time ago who was very upset with me that, you know, he did not see what, you know, social justice work had to do with physics. And so we had to have conversations about that. But anyway, from, you know, physics professors <laughs> to people who work in procurement, <laughs> you know, all of us can be doing our work through an equity lens and that is inclusive excellence. And that is what I hope we will be working towards on this campus. That's fantastic, Colleen. And <laughs> I want to thread a question. It's lower on our, our list, but it's it's a similar um, theme. Um, and you've sort of answered this a bit already. So, so feel free to not expand if there's um, not need. But the question is about the framing of inclusive excellence and how it might be shaping the next chapter of DEIJ work at CSU. Do you want to expand in that sense? Yeah, I'm just, just to add a couple things to what I've already said. Um, you know, the, the new Office of Inclusive Excellence. So previously we focused only on faculty and staff, but now we're, we're focusing on faculty, staff and students, which I think is, um, you know, exciting and, and appropriate for diversity, for 21st century diversity work, I will say, right? So um, being able to do all three and, and think about all three as we do our work um, reminds me of something that I actually have, said a lot in the past few years and and people who are close to me and <laughs> I've heard it even at Colorado State in the in my first couple of months which is um we really should be focusing on our climate right so the climate that exists on campus affects faculty staff and students and affects our individual as well as collective experience whether we stay here for a few years or whether we're here for decades, right? And so um, the other issue or thing that I think about when I think about climate, um, I think about equity gaps a lot and opportunity gaps. And I and I've said this in various spaces before, but I haven't said it in this interview. So for some of you, it will be new. Um, one of the things that really keeps me up at night in thinking about how best to accomplish this work is 
um, how do we identify and then effectively address every equity and opportunity gap that exists between majority individuals and um, other individuals on this campus, right? Um, and they have been well documented for higher ed. Um, some examples I would give is equity different equity gaps in let's say if we take students, are there equity gaps in uh, GPA attainment? Are there equity gaps in time to graduate? Um, if those exist at Colorado State, I would like us to take take it on. And I and I do know that um, it's a concern that's also shared by the provost. So we commiserate on on that. So getting the the data and understanding where the gaps are, and then working to address them and eventually eliminate them for me is absolutely the kind of work that I want to be doing and that I hope many of you are ready to, to join me join me in so that's great Dr. Cipriani and we've had a couple hard hitting questions or, or at okay. least have your questions so let's get to a quick fun one you <laughs> recently went to your first CSU football game and are officially now a member of the Ramley as we love to um, <laughs> Say. Yes. What is your go-to sporting event food? <sighs> so <laughs> I I really like the popcorn. <laughs> that is the correct answer. <laughs> I really like the popcorn. I think I think sporting events have amazing popcorn, second only to movie theaters. AMC, if I'm being really specific. <laughs> so, <laughs> That is great. Do you do you have a favorite sporting event to watch or play? I um I'm not very sporting myself. I prefer just, you know, being on a treadmill, very safe. <laughs> but um uh I do enjoy basketball. I, I would say I enjoy basketball and uh, my son played basketball. Um, all through high school, and those were some of the um, the best times sitting on that bench. Except do, when it, during the winter, and you had to drive in the snow, that wasn't so much fun. But yeah, basketball would be my sport. <laughs> that is great. I am also not athletically inclined, which some people tell me is a waste of my height. So I under I understand that. I like to watch the sports as well. <laughs> So thinking about the unique challenges and the opportunities um, that the past few years have presented university communities, especially in light of the pandemic and the national international movements for racial justice, what's an insight or a lesson that you've learned that you're taking with you as you move forward, maybe in this position or in life? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, after the death of George Floyd, I obviously wasn't here, I was on another campus, but I think uh, many people talked about feeling a shift, right? With how many individuals who um, identity wise would not necessarily connect with a George Floyd, but connected with that act of violence and understood that they didn't, they wanted to be a part of a country or a campus, where um, we work towards ensuring those type of incidents stop happening, right? So I talked to a number of people, uh, and I'm sure many people here at Colorado State um, did as well after in the months after that happened that, that I don't know would have reached out to me in my role as Senior Diversity Equity and Inclusion Officer to talk about what can I do? What are we doing as a school? What are we doing as a campus? What can I do as an individual? Um, and I'm not gonna pretend that it wasn't simultaneously um, exhausting as well as heartening to see that people um, who might not have seen a place for themselves in any sort of social justice movement were, I will use the term somewhat awakened and ready to do something, even if they weren't sure what that was. So I think that provides us as certainly a campus community and as a country, an opportunity to ensure that we keep doing better and being better. There, we, we need to move away from, I don't know, it's all, it's uh, the word that comes to my mind is stasis, right? <laughs> Just around, because these events, uh, there have been many over years and I, don't know that they're going anywhere necessary, necessarily. So it's, it's easy to, um, you know, get used to them. 
and not have the same sort of strength of reaction every time. But, you know, I, I just think it the important thing for us to remember in this moment, you know, while we're still in a pandemic, while we're still dealing with some of the after effects of that horrific murder, is, um, you know, how do we, in whatever circle we are in, I mean, you don't have to be um, uh, working in OIE to, to do this work and to be effective at this work, right? How do we, you know, if we want to be an ally, if we are interested in building our own individual capacity to be allies in this work, what are we going to do? It could be one thing you choose to do this entire academic year. We don't want to overburden people and we don't want to wear people out because this is definitely, it's not a battle, right? It's a journey. I mean, I, I'm move away from the war references. It's a, it's, a, it's a journey. So we don't want people to get, you know, overwhelmed and too tired. We want them on this journey with us for as long as possible. So, you know, I think a lot about using this moment in time to build allyship, to ensure that um, we just have more and more people understand that this isn't who we are. And even if it might be who we are on certain days in certain instances, it's not who we wanna be and we can work towards being better and doing better, so. That was that a long answer, like a, sorry. No, that was great, Colleen. <laughs> Does, it feels like the call to action, like reinvigorating yeah. that call to action to welcome folks into this work who might have been on the outskirts with an interest but hadn't taken it up themselves. So that's, that was great. So you uh, you mentioned in your introduction, you, you touched on this um, subject a bit, so feel free to expand, but you've spent, obviously, as you mentioned, many years in the STEM field, um, as that's where you got your start. Can you expand or speak to those experiences and how they shape your approach to inclusive excellence work? Yeah, so um, I think I, I bring a very sort of data informed approach to my work because, you know, because of my, my STEM background. So I, I believe in making data informed decisions. So um, you know, I ask a lot of questions <laughs> about, about data. Like I previously, I talked about equity gaps, right? So, you know, I'd love to understand if they, if they are present here on this campus, where, where are they? Who are the groups being represented? Um, I've seen, so for instance, I often see data that is aggregate data around race and ethnicity with students, faculty, and staff. First thing I ask for is disaggregation of the data. I was taught a long time ago by a beloved mentor of mine that when you do this work, inclusive excellence work, aggregation of data hides a multitude of sins. And I'm quoting Dr. Carolyn Johnson. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, I, I would like to see disaggregated data because I wanna understand what's happening for populations. I'd like to understand that for as many populations as possible. Uh, but I also have to acknowledge that we don't collect data on every population for a number of reasons, and privacy is sometimes one of them. So, so understanding what our um, minoritized populations, who they are, where they are on campus, and what their experience has been, I, I bring my whole sort of um, uh, STEM background on how I approach problems in order to solve them to this work in this way, so. That's great, and shameless plug since we're talking about data for those <laughs> of you on the on this call that have not completed the employee climate survey and are an employee at CSU. That is one way that we gather data about our climate, so we Absolutely. encourage you to complete that survey. Uh, let's go to some lighthearted questions, Colleen. We'll do a few <laughs> in a row here to give your, your brain a break from some of the heavier questions. Thank what you. is one thing that people might be surprised to learn about you? Oh, I feel like I'm such an open book. I don't know if I could surprise anyone at this point. Um, uh, I, I do not like the dark. I never say I'm afraid of it. I just prefer light. <laughs> I also relate to that. I like, I like the phrasing. I'm not afraid. I just prefer. Yes. 
So any local restaurants that you've tried and loved so far here in the Fort Collins general community? Yes. And actually, that's the one thing that I'm, I'm behind on my trying out restaurants. <laughs> so, um, but I really love the Emporium downtown. And I'm very excited. And actually, this one came from Raya, <laughs> um, Lucille. She told me about Lucille's the other day, and it's on my list. I love Cajun food. I love spicy food. Um, so I can't wait to try Lucille's. <laughs> oh, it is excellent. That is definitely a top three brunch place for me. So what do you like to do for fun, Dr. Cipriani? Yes, also, uh, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I am I, at this point in my life, I'm pretty boring. I, you know, my life, I have a, I'm busy. Um, I have been working. I raised two kids, well, you know, while working. So really fun for me now is like being still. I really enjoy being able to sit on my couch. <laughs> and look at Netflix <laughs> for like if I get to do that for two hours in a row that is a good time okay <laughs> so. absolutely that's a perfect segue because the next question is what are you reading or watching right now um um I just finished watching um I feel like if talk about shameless plugs like I feel like I'm giving Netflix a bunch of shameless plugs but I just finished watching made on Netflix and it really sucked me in um um and because of what I do I watch the whole <laughs> you know season 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 one of, of made um with an eye to all the ways in which um we have so much work to do to address real life inequities and difficulties for real life Americans, people in this country, right? And and so, yeah, so I thought it was um, an amazingly well done way to highlight um, e even, even with the social services and things we have to help individuals who are financially or, um, in other ways in trouble, how difficult it can be to navigate our cumbersome systems. And, you know, why does it have to be this way? Surely there's an easier way. So anyway, so made kind of sucked me in. So if you guys haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it on Netflix. <laughs> it's on the list. I hadn't heard of that one yet. <laughs> yes, uh, Maid, Colleen... M-A-I-D, not M-A-D-E, M-A-I-D. <laughs> Colleen, if you'd like to grab a sip of water, you I know you've been speaking for a bit of time and I'll do a little update to folks. We are getting towards the end of our list of um, pre-planned questions that we gathered from our communities uh, and network. So we have some questions coming in through the chat. I encourage you if you haven't placed your question in the Q&A to please go ahead and do so now. So we have two final questions before we get to our, our community sourced questions through the Zoom platform. Colleen, when you think about the courageous strategic transformation and the work that you've been involved in thus far, what are you most excited about as we move forward? Yeah, so I love this question because I am I, well, I'm, I'm sort of nerdy. I've always been a nerd since a child, right? Clearly, I majored in, in microbiology. That's probably, I probably shouldn't be saying that. I, I retract that. <laughs> but I, I love strategic planning. This is where I was going with that. So, so I was very excited to be joining the CSU family, the Ramley, um, in the midst of um, strategic, strategic planning. I, I believe in, you know, we need to where we're going, we need to be able to set goals and direct resources to help us get there. So I, I love being a part of that process. I also love that I was able to meet and I am able to meet so many, you know, of my new colleagues relatively quickly because we are going through that process, right? So I sit on obviously the IE drafting group and our chair is Kyle Oldham and he um, has been here several years, much longer than I have, and he has been wonderful as a chair and all the members on the group being able to be a part of their conversations, learning about their individual stories, um, how they came to CSU, their experience at CSU, you know, what, how, what they know we can do better and how they want to be a part of that. It's all been very excited and, you know, exciting and makes me really um, hopeful. I really, uh, I, I have a lot of, um, 
I feel really good about the future, um, being able to have these conversations with individuals who see very clearly, you know, where we can do better, but also are willing to do their fair share and probably even more than their fair share to ensure that we get there. So that's been really invigorating. And uh, yeah, I'm thankful for the strategic planning process that, that, that we are in the midst of now. That's great. So the last question you have, you have answered a bit in some of your other answers. Um, so again, an opportunity to expand if you see the need. There have been, as you mentioned, a lot of exciting changes happening to the Office of Inclusive Excellence, mm -hmm. including the um, merging of the student diversity and resource centers and offices coming under the umbrella of OIE. Can you speak about some of the changes and maybe more so how they will impact the greater university community in this work going forward? Yeah, so um, one of the things, and this, one of the things I think that we experience here at CSU is a lot of, um, and many institutions this size, is a lot of siloing, right? So individuals doing great work in their area, in their certain you know, corner, if you will, of campus, and not really um, having the opportunity to partner. And sometimes they don't have the opportunity because you know, it's as simple as you don't know about work that's going on elsewhere, right? So um, I really think that IE work across campus can and should benefit from, um, you know, more connections, more opportunities for partnership, more um, uh, focus, if you would, on some big picture things. And I'm thinking here again, specifically about climate, because, you know, it, it's, it's easier when you have the group all together, those working on faculty staff issues, as well as student issues, to sort of see things from the point of view of the environment. And if we can understand how the environment, the climate, thank you, Britt, for the plug for the climate survey, is affecting all of us, then it's, it theoretically should be easier for us to then do our work, right? We can design trainings, initiatives, opportunities, programs with what we already know are gaps in our climate. So, so I see it as like sort of coming full circle and really necessary for us to um, more completely and certainly more efficiently address any climate issues we have on this campus. Thank you for that. And thanks for your openness and insights so far, Colleen. I know it's a, a lot to be put on the spot for 200 plus folks to hear from you. So at this time, we're gonna go ahead and start taking the questions that have come in through the Q&A feature and the chat. And the first question, there's a couple that are related. So I'm gonna sort of combine them in a two part question. So we'll start with part one. Claire asks, Dr. Cipriani, thank you so much for speaking about this. I work for the city of Fort Collins and would love to hear specific suggestions for supporting and strengthening our diverse communities within the city to make the city a more desirable location for people to come live and work. So that's part one of our community focused questions. Yeah, you know, um, the term that comes to mind is brain drain. So um, at the institutions I, I have been at previously, we had the same issue, you know, wonderful people come to campus either to further their education or to further their career. How do we, you know, yeah, how do we um, ensure that they feel enough of a part of the community so that they will want to stay beyond three, five, maybe 15 years, <laughs> you know, you know, so it's a, it's a really good question. And yes, I do think that the campus uh, should and, and it does um, work closely with the city to sort of create opportunities and um, initiatives focused on um, encouraging the people that we want to stay to stay. So I'll give you a very concrete example, Claire. I think you said my name is Claire. And that is um, uh, looking at, so for instance, 
we know, I, you know, one of the things I learned very quickly after arriving here, actually before, because I looked into it, is how the, the cost of housing in, in Fort Collins, right? So how can the campus and the city work together to sort of develop plans and programs that can help make you know entry level career folk people who are just graduating from CSU and with their first job afford you know the type of housing that they would like so that they could stay and work at not just CSU but other places here in town and I know that there have been places in this country where um, the city and the campus the town and gown relationship did did produce um, concrete sort of financial incentives, say, to for home ownership. Um, and so, so those are some of the things I hope that we can and are looking into. That's great. The second part of the question, I kind of like the, the cascadingness of these questions. So the mm -hmm. first seems a little more systemic focused. And this question is from Karen. As a previous employee and CSU alum, now I am a community member. How can I, as a community member, be involved in your office and assist you with DEI initiatives on campus? I would love to serve because it is my passion and I love my alma mater. Um, so yeah, this one seems a bit more focused on the individual yeah. community members that I'm sure many of which are on this call. Yeah, no, happy to answer that. So, you know, we um, always happy to hear from individuals from the community. I mean, it, it is as simple as emailing one of us, right? So all of our, um, our um, contact information is on CSU's website. And if you have an idea, if you have a, you know, if you have a thought, if you have, you know, we, we love to hear from you. There, there will be more formal ways to be involved. Um, we have a number of advisory committees and task force, some of which are on pause right now as we are reimagining um, what the work of these groups should be. Um, and that will be that will become more clear to all of us as we get to the end of the strategic planning process. But absolutely, I would say there will be opportunities to serve more formally on, you know, for community members, especially those who are, you know, alum, um, in terms of interacting with us, um, helping us understand what the needs and priorities should be from your perspective as a community member and alum, and you know, helping us um, fine tune our our initiatives and our plans based on your feedback. So, thanks, Dr. Cipriani. So the next question is specific about a, a course in particular. So I'm gonna to try to expand it a little bit. Um, so, the, so David's asking about, um, he teaches a course titled Law and the Arts in the Arts mm. Management Master's Program. And he says that he's added a module this fall around HR and DEI, and is wondering if you have recommendations for specific elements around DEI, DIJ, that you feel strongly should be included in a course like this for future arts leadership. So maybe even if you'd like to speak to that in particular, but expand it about what pieces could be included in coursework um, broadly. Yeah, well, well, no, thank you for the question, David. And thank you for, for adding this module to your class. Um, I, you know, really generally without seeing your syllabus, um, I would say when I, when in your send, when you put HR and DEI together, where my mind immediately goes is worker rights, right? And so, um, you know, how do we, how do we a, as a community uh, provide more, you know, stable and sustainable rights for workers in this country? We've learned a lot about the plight of workers. Um, through the pandemic and 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 sections of of our of 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 our um labor force that are harder hit and are often the ones that can least take a hit when i think about the arts i mean i i'm i'm pretty sure i saw a story on cnn the other day about um people in the movie industry threatening to strike right because um they, they're not well paid, they're not allowed a lot of breaks. So, um, so my knee jerk response, David, without seeing your syllabus is certainly um, talking more about the intersections of DEI J with an emphasis on the J justice work 
and worker rights, because um, we have a long way to go in certain, especially for certain um, segments of the labor force in this country in that in that area. That's my suggestion, but happy to talk more. Our next question comes from Janae. From a student perspective, DEIJ or inclusive excellence efforts have been re relegated to discussion or dialogue and catchphrases. What do you think is needed to move into a space of action? And how do you foresee granting students agency to engage in this process? Yeah, thank you, Janae. It's a, um, a good question. It's a tough question. I mean, I, I think that um, action happens on multiple levels and in multiple ways. So for myself in my role um, and working with fellow leaders, I see myself very, you know, as a part of my role to sort of actively um, guide and assist and help fellow leaders in seeing what we need to do collectively as leadership on this campus. And that, that is very action focused because, you know, I, I agree with Janae, I, I myself have been um, sometimes frustrated with um, our prose, which can be lovely. And I can also write wonderful prose, not as well as Brit. She's better than me at that. But, you know, yes, I do understand that there are things we need to write and say, but then there are things that we need to do and we need to be willing to move into action. So I understand that question and I see um, my role as one helping to spur others to action. So, um, yeah. And the second part of the question, sorry, I know there was a two part. Um. The second part of the question is, how do you foresee granting students agency to engage in this process? Oh, yes. So we also, I, I spoke previously about advisory groups and task force, and we have had student representation on these groups. And I think that's critical. Um, again, much like um, what I said before with the community member, I think any student on this campus should feel free to email us. Um, I know many students um, are involved with the uh, resource and cultural centers. And, you know, the, if they feel more comfortable speaking to staff there, um, it's critical that um, the information that they share, the changes that they seek are, are also shared beyond those. And I'm happy to be a part of those conversations and to Janae's point, a part of the plan to action. So, you know, what are we gonna do about many of these things? And I will say coming in and doing my own research as a new employee, there are many things going on on campus in this area. Um, we just need to continue to connect and elevate some of them so that more people know about the work that the good work that's being done in this area on this campus. Okay, Eric's question. I definitely hear and feel you on the legacy aspect of core work you've broke ground for since you've joined CSU and became a piece of the Rams mosaic. Oh, I like that. Hey, That's mosaic. nice, Eric. I like that too, yes. <laughs> it is no taboo that there are still great challenges ahead of your tenure. My question is, based on your broad, unique experience, what do you believe must stand as an utmost priority in order to engrave what's right in the fabric of CSU's culture here on out? Mm -hmm. And how do you intend to federate the generations to come to stand for diversity and inclusion? Okay, utmost priority, I would say, is everyone seeing that they have a part in this work. Um, I, I think this might be the third time I'm saying it, so I won't underscore it anymore. <laughs> but I, I really believe it's critical for every single person on this campus to understand that they are, whether they know it or not, participating in this work. They are paying into the climate. They're either doing so positively or negatively. And we would like less people to do so negatively, more people to do so positively, and we're happy to help. That's why we offer trainings. So I think the, that's the utmost priority is that everyone needs to see themselves as a part of this work and to be questioning, what am I doing to make this a more inclusive campus? So that's my answer to the first part. The second part, federating the generations. Yes, 
love <laughs> the future generations. You know, I two things I would say to that. I believe in leading by example. So, you know, I, I think um, one of the ways is to be able to leave a legacy that people will connect with and want to be a part of, right? So, so, so that's what we wanna show for future generations who come to this campus long after I have left. And my part B is connected. And that is how do we institutionalize some of the good work that's being done here? Many times um, on campuses that look like CSU, so I'm speaking specifically about large land grant, historically white institutions. I happen to know a lot about them. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on them in the past 30 years or so. Um, you know, many times uh, this work is connected to an individual or a program or a college or a dean, a specific leader. And when that person leaves, moves on to something else, the work evaporates. We have got to stop that terrible cycle and I'm committed to stopping it uh, um, here at, at CSU. So, um, you know, I have to give kudos to, 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 to President McConnell and Provost Peterson uh, because they saw this as an opportunity when my predecessor, Marion Taveros, uh, retired to not lessen, but to um, enlarge, right? And, and I think that is the way we should be looking at this work at campuses that look like CSU if we're ever going to make meaningful, sustainable change, you know, not being on this wheel where we're having this. Uh, you know, 10 years, every 10 years, we have different versions of the same conversations and we're not seeming to be able to make progress. So we need to get off that wheel. And part of that is institutionalizing some of these things. So they become a part of our fabric. It's teaching, research, extension, and IE in my world, in my mind. <laughs> that's great. And I think that's a really great segue to Katie's question. Um, she's asking, do you have any recommendations for people who want to get into careers with stronger or direct emphasis in DEIJ? Oh. Um, I think learn as much as you can. You know, one of the things that was really important for me coming to this work as a microbiologist was, okay, I was a professional in microbiology. I want to be a professional in DEIJ work. What does that look like? And what do I need? And, you know, so seeking out um, very, I had excellent mentors when I started off in this work that really pointed me to places like NCOR, so the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in um, U.S. higher education. I know it's a long, long, long <laughs> long phrase. Um, but that's like the, in terms of DIJ professional development in this country, I would say that's probably the top conference happens every May. Um, and I try to go to it every May, <laughs> every May. Um, so learning about what it means to be in this work as a professional and getting the right types of um, professional development and co will be one of them. There are others, AACU, so the American Association of Colleges and Universities, who, and it was actually this organization that coined the term inclusive excellence. They offer an inclusive excellence conference um, every two years, I think. So getting plugged in with other professionals who do this work and learning about their paths and identifying mentors, it's the same advice for any um, profession, right? So yeah, that would be my advice. Great. So we have, I uh, think, time for about one or two more questions. So our next question is from Dr. Ashley Grice. What do you say to those who adamantly believe that inclusion, equity, social justice doesn't belong in the classrooms, lectures, in athletics, et cetera? How do you or would you promote more community responsibility around inclusive excellence at CSU? Yeah. Um, you know, I will say, Dr. Grice, thank you for that tough question. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I'm being recorded. Um, I, I would say respectively, respect, respective, respectfully, sorry. <laughs> I'm laughing and trying to get the word out at the same time. Um, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, and, and I have said that over the years, as I said earlier, to many um, 
primarily STEM professionals because that was who was in my world um, 20 years ago. And we can talk about it, we can discuss it, we can debate it, we can agree to disagree, but I think that you are wrong. Um, and how would I promote more community responsibility? You know, I, again, I, the way in which I have done it and what has really worked for me is leading by example. What I found, and I honestly don't think that CSU is going to be any different in this regard. Um, what I found is that there are way more people who want to help, who want to be involved in this work, who want to contribute, but many of them just don't know what to do. And frankly, if I'm being open and frank for these past couple minutes, for these last couple minutes, um, you know, it, the cancel culture world that we live in today is making it even more difficult for people who want to help um, and who want to, uh, to be a part of this work and who want to be an ally to identify themselves and put themselves out there because they're afraid of saying the wrong thing, using the wrong words, um, offending, uh, the you know any group, and so so I would say I will continue to do what I've always done, and that is invite people in, um, give people space and grace to make a mistake because sometimes I'm gonna make a mistake, and I hope my colleagues will give me some space and some grace, and you know let's advance together as a group, as a campus. So yeah, so I, I kind of just, I do what I do and I don't spend a lot of time and energy because it is draining to have to continually, um, you know, try to convince a person or a group of people that, you know, that this work is important, that this, that this work belongs here at CSU, no matter whether we're talking about ag or vet med or public health, I'm naming all the areas I was in, that's I just, also, um, you know, there's IE, there's equity and social justice work that can be done. You can choose and as an individual not to assist, but I, I do think that we need to think about ways to uplift those individuals who um, are actively assisting. Um, and maybe in that way, we can, uh, we can get some converts amongst the people who don't see that they should be doing it or don't see the benefit of doing this work. I mean, there, there are some ways in which um, there, are, there are, we certainly have carrots <laughs> here in the academy and we need to figure out how to dole out the carrots. And if we need a stick, we need to be prepared to dole one out as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Cipriani. And, and thank you, Dr. Grice, for that question. Um, I think that was a really great way to end our session. Do you have any final remarks you'd like to share before I wrap us up? Colleen. No, I just I like to say thank you for everyone um, for coming and and ask, asking these questions. You know, some of them were tough, but they're certainly all relevant to things that we have to face as um, a campus community and honestly as a country. So I appreciate. I remember saying to both Britt and Raya when we started this, like, who wants to come and hear more about me? I'm certainly can't be that interesting and what will I say for a whole hour but I appreciate the opportunity and um, you know I hope to meet many of you in person as time goes on um, thank you for showing up <laughs> thank you Dr. Cipriani and apparently over 200 people wanted to hear what you had to say and stayed for our whole session so thank you all again for joining us so Raya part. was right. I got to jump in and say Raya Villa was right. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Raya. So just thank you, Colleen, on behalf of everybody's attending and our whole office for your vulnerability, your expertise, your insights today. Really appreciate it. I just also have to say thank you to Vice President Janelle for being with us and helping opening, uh, open, opening our session today. And thank you to our interpreters and Chrisanna for helping with the logistics and making sure our session is accessible. I dropped the evaluation link into the chat. It's a, a evaluation for all of the Tuesday sessions. So if you need a reminder, today's session is called Get to Know Dr. Colleen Cipriani, Vice President for Inclusive Excellence. Colleen, thank you so very much again for your time today. And 
wishing everyone well as they move into the rest of their day. Thank you. Bye.